Good evening. I'm Willard Morgan. Tonight on the Great Motion Picture Studios, we examine Vespucci Pictures. Much has been written in recent years about the group of studios, such as Republic and Monogram, which formed the subdivision of Hollywood known as Poverty Row. These were studios which built their reputations on low-budget, quickie films. Films so inexpensive they were virtually guaranteed of turning a profit. However, little has been said about the cheapest studio of them all, a studio which formed a subdivision all by itself, known as Destitution Alley, or as Hollywood Wags dubbed it, the Black Hole of Calcutta. This was Vespucci Pictures, which operated from 1937 to 1957, under the exclusive control and management of its founder, Elliot Melnick. Yeah, uh, it was in 1936. My brother Sid and I were in the clothing business on the Lower East Side. I had just turned 21 years old. So one day I come in and I find he ordered a hundred yards of satin behind my back. Can you believe it? I mean, do you know how expensive satin is? So I said, Sid, what do you want with all that satin? And do you want we should go broke? So he says, what do you want for my life? Don't bother me. Go make movies. So, uh, of course, I came to Hollywood and did just that. But I brought with me the business know-how that made the Melnick Brothers store such a huge success before my schmuck of a brother bought all that satin. And I also brought with me a motto that has guided my thinking throughout all of my careers. Mr. Melnick, why did you decide to name your studio Vespucci Pictures? Oh, yes. <laughs> Vespucci never made the musicals a big spectacle, but uh, they did. Noted film know. historian Vespucci William K. Everson. As a matter of fact, Vespucci made over a thousand films in the uh, 20 years of their existence. And uh, while their output as a whole is undeniably cheap and shoddy, one is forced to the admission that uh, the films are pretty dreadful. Uh, I've, um, I don't think there's a, there's a decent film in the bunch, and I've seen them all. Under, without question, uh, Best Pucci films really stunk. Of course we cut corners. I made an art of cutting corners. How do you think we're able to make money? For instance, most studios use anywhere from four to eight sound stages to shoot their pictures on. Now, uh, at Vespucci, we use only one sound stage, uh, which we divided with a screen so we could shoot two pictures at once on it. See? I have given this affair my closest attention, and I now know who murdered Mr. Josiah Amberley. But home, who could it possibly be? The culprit is none other than... The king approaches! All hell the king! Hail! Hail! Hail the king! Hail the king! All hail! All hail! Hail! Hail the king! The king! Hail! Hail! Hail the king! Hail the king! All hail! All hail! Hail! Hail the king! The king! Coleman, of the famous musical comedy writing team of Coleman and Brown, recalls his visit to Vespucci. Well, Alice Brown and I had just finished a run of our show, Terrific Town, in 1944, when we got this call from Vespucci Pictures. It seems they had decided to make musical films and wanted us to write them. So we grabbed a super cheap out to L.A. and were given a tour of the studio. And were we surprised when we came to the music department. The entire department consisted of one old man who played the accordion. And the only song he knew was Asleep in the Deep. Sweetheart, the night is so beautiful and I love you so much. I feel... Yes, my love? I feel like singing. Well, I have to admit that when we were just starting out, things were pretty tight. For instance, I remember we couldn't afford proper back projection, uh, which you know is used to give an outdoors effect in the studio. We had to make do with slides, uh, usually my holiday snapshots. 
sweetheart, Grant's tomb is so beautiful, and I love you so much. I feel... Yes, my love? I feel like singing. Many Vespucci costume designer, not. Eve Samaritz. Uh, yes, that's true, of course, but uh, with a cheapskate like Melnick running the show, I couldn't do a thing I wanted to. Let's say, for example, we were doing a gangster movie. The leading man would wear um, a suit, usually with Steve Olsen's suit. Steve was the man on our boom microphone and pretty much average build. One of his suits would fit almost any actor on the lot. And being high up on the boom, no one ever noticed that he was in his underwear most of the time. But I think the, the biggest problem I had was with the World War II films we did. Since the Vespucci staff was composed almost entirely of draft dodgers, getting proper uniforms was actually impossible. We just had to make do with what we had, and that caused some problems. On our invasion of Normandy picture, we had, well, we had the Confederacy fighting the Salvation Army. Uh, Get Em Soldiers was directed by Armand Hoxie. I remember that out of 1,034 pictures made at Vespucci, Armand directed 912 of them. I personally made 93, and 22 were directed by passersby. Now, Armand was some kind of a director. Hey, everybody, it's movie time. Is everybody ready? Popular Western author Brett Champion. Well, shoot. I mean, it wasn't like I wasn't already pretty well known. After all, even by 1940, I had written maybe 30 Western novels. Some of them were real popular, too, like uh, uh, Red Eye Drifter, Man with the Faded Chaps. Still, I gotta admit, it was a real thrill when Bess Pugy Ask this old rover to take over their Western film unit. Said I would have total control making Westerns about the old West to show what the West was really like back then and, and out West. Well, you can imagine my shock when they told me that their Western unit was located on the East Coast. Those suckers shot all their cowboy pictures in an old shed out in Astoria, Long Island or somewhere. Shoot. I mean, what's a fella supposed to do? Howdy. 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 Sure is a hot day. Sure is. When, when's the marshals supposed to get into town? Town. Why, he's supposed to get into town by the new train. Vernon Elder. Considered one of the most talented writers of the 1930s, Mr. Elder was prized at the Algonquin Round Table for his quick wit and incisive aphorisms. Perhaps best known for his prestigious Clay City novel, he was summoned to Hollywood in 1939 to write for Vespucci Pictures. Quickly signed to a long-term contract, Mr. Elder wrote over 450 films before his retirement in 1955, including Harold's Favorite Secretary, Honey of a Honeymoon, and Rhythm in a Rowboat. 
we were indeed privileged to have been granted an interview with the 1937 Pulitzer Prize winner, Vernon Elder. Mr. Elder, could you tell us something of the pressure you had to work under in a factory like Vespucci? So... Uh, Mr. Elder... No, what I'm asking is... Would you please answer? Mr. Elder, would you please... No, Mr. Elder, would you please answer my question? Mr. Elder... Look, we did a couple of really arty films, but the public just wouldn't buy them. Best Future made only one so-called art film, as I recall it. It was a version of Othello with all the major roles played by ducks. It was a somewhat misfire attempt to capture both the art crowd and the kitty Saturday morning matinee market at the same time. As I remember, all the voices were done by Mel Blanc. Even by Best Future standards, it was a crummy film. Who's there? Is it my lord, Othello? I, Desdemona. Will you come to bed, my lord? Should you play tonight, Desdemona? Hi, my lord. If you bethink yourself of any crime, therefore confess the freely of thy sin, cannot remove nor choke the strong conception that I do groan with us, thou art to die. The Lord have mercy on me. By heaven, I saw my handkerchief in his hand. O oh, perjured woman, thou dost stone my heart and makest me call what I intend to do. A murder, I saw in a handkerchief. Suffering succotash. Then there was that unspeakable science fiction film, The Dog That Got Real Big. you want about our pictures. When it came to comedy, we had the greatest, the funniest crosstalk team in vaudeville, Block and Tackle. Do you remember them? I'm sorry, I can't say that I do. Well, they were before your time, but they had a hilarious act. <laughs> Whatever Tackle did something stupid, Block made him swallow a whole grapefruit. Classic stuff. <laughs> we put him in a great series of pictures. A block and tackle meet Manhattan gangsters. Block and tackle go Hollywood. Their army picture, the silly sergeants. And of course, they're unforgettable. Block and tackle meet scary people. Gee, Block, is, is this where we're supposed to deliver the chocolate soda? It sure looks scary. It must be tackle. Gee, I wonder, I wonder why the boss made us Come way out here. Why, you moron, he wouldn't have made us do it if he hadn't stuck his hand in the milkshake blender. Gosh, Block, I'm sorry. When he asked to shake hands, I, I thought he said he wanted a handshake. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, on. Why, you lunkhead, ring that bell. No, Block, you do it. I'm scared. Why, you blithering idiot.
just four days later, I had to close Miss Beauty Pictures. You can't imagine how that broke my heart. But I'm proud to say that in my current position, I continue to give the public the same quality and craftsmanship that I gave them in my motion pictures. Now, if you'd excuse me, I must be getting back to work. Thank you, Mr. Melnick. Thank you. The story of this Gucci Pictures, a studio where money was king and art was no object. There can be no better way to conclude this tribute than with how Vespucci started each of their films. The Vespucci trademark. This is a Vespucci picture.